is I want to talk about what a mental health, what 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 the mental health world is going to look like, um, and the healthcare world is going to look like in terms of the the post COVID landscape, right? Um, I think we're we're all dealing with a collective trauma right now. Um, you know, we're we're dealing with the collective trauma that we're that we're all stuck inside, and we all want to go out and do the things that we always did. Um, you know, uh, it is it is difficult. We're all in a difficult position. Some of us also have additional stresses of finances to concern, be concerned about, living situations. What are we going to do uh, about work? Essential workers especially have a lot of um, health uh, issues to be concerned about. And um, what, what I think we need to be aware of is that we're all in this together. And what that means is we have to stand by each other. That's we the people. We the people have to stand by each other. Uh, on the ground floor, we have to make sure we're we're taking care of each other. And and to me, what that means is uh, that we have to understand and acknowledge that we collectively have been through some shit, and we process that shit in different ways. Um, and understanding and acknowledging the way that we process that shit, um, and and maybe even just asking, right? If you know that somebody's going through a particularly tough time. Just asking, like, hey, what do you need right now? Um, other than for things to go back to the way they were, what do you need? What is what is the thing that can help kind of center your 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 mental health? Um, and it and it might just be, you know, let's do a Zoom call or something. Let's do. Uh, I need to go take a walk more often, um, you know. And we just kind of have to be there for each other. Um, and we need to be patient. That's a big thing. I think right now we have to be patient with each other, um, especially especially after they open things completely back up, right? If we get to that point where everything is is set back to uh, you know 100% capacity at your bars and restaurants, and you can go visit your friends and. You know, you can go and see a, a comedy show or a band um, or, or this, that, and the other thing, right? You, we have to be a little bit patient with each other. So for so because I'm in the arts world, I, I'll, I'll speak from a performer perspective, is this means that we as performers can't get pissed off that audiences aren't immediately showing back up to our shows. Um, you know, so they might not be able to. They might be scared, they might be nervous, and we as performers have to understand that. We as performers have to be like, "Hey, it's cool. I totally get it. Um, you know, I no no worries. Uh, I'll I'll see you on the next video. Maybe you leave a comment, right? Some whatever it is. Um, and audiences, if you're a fan of a venue, if you're a fan of a particular performer, um, be patient." They might not be ready to get back on the road, just like Jay just said, you know, um, and, and same with me is I'm staying put. I'm staying put. Um, I'm, I'm a little concerned. I'm a little concerned that, you know, we don't have a particular plan in place and we are we are moving too quickly. And and that's just now. So let's say everything comes back to being open 100 percent. There's going to be a couple of venues that are like, ah, we're not ready. We're not ready. We got to do some cleaning before we're willing to let the public back in. And I've met the public, and some of some of the public is gross. I worked at a Starbucks for fucking three years, and the literal shit that I have seen. Oof. Some of y'all in the public are gross. Okay, some it, it doesn't take that, guys. It's not that hard to flush. That's all I'm saying. Okay, so some of these venues might be like, maybe I'm not ready for just a just a total spray in the bathroom. Maybe I'm not ready for that. I'm sorry to get gross. But, you know, so audiences have to be a little bit more patient uh, with venues. Uh, maybe it's this is the time that you learn, you know, how to be a, a good uh, good pooper in a bathroom. 
take the time to really perfect that art while you're in the quarantine. <laughs> take the time. Uh, you know, dudes, when you're when you're peeing, aim. Boom. This is the time. This is the time to perfect that aim. We can do this. We can do this as a community. We can do this as a society. So that so that these poor venues uh, don't have to uh, clean our uh, pee and poop. Sorry to get gross, you guys. I'm sorry to get gross, but this is this is an important PSA, I think. Uh, but we have to be we have to be um, we have to be patient with each other. Um, and in terms of in terms of touring performers not being able to get back out there. Um, I've said this before, I consider myself lucky that my expenses are not as high as they could be. Um, I still have bills that I need to take care of. I still have debt that I need to take care of. Um, but I, I, I could be in a worse position. Getting back out on the road is a costly process. There is food, gas, and lodging that need to be considered at all times. Because of this crisis, like I, I'm, I'm, I sleep on people's couches. That's what like comedians open up their homes to me, musicians, uh, couch surfing. It, that's part of the thing that with this crisis is like it's going to be real difficult for me to ask other people for doing that. Um, so there is a a financial stress involved in just the aspect of touring. So if I can't figure that out, or or what that's going to be like in August then being a touring performer um, becomes a lot more difficult because now, you know, if I, you know, if I have a hundred dollar baseline, I need to make a hundred dollars to come out on top to make a, to net positive. If I need to get lodging, maybe I need to make $200 now to net positive. And if a venue only seats 20 people, I'm not going to clear that especially if they're taking 10% of the door or something. Um, so again, be patient with each other. There's, there are financial stresses on either side, right? And they become survival stresses. How are you going to, how are you going to get through this thing? Um, you know, like it took me a while. I did these videos every day and it was kind of stressful and I got a bunch of stress migraines and I got to keep wearing these sunglasses. Uh, if I'm going to be in front of this light, uh, there were certain things that I needed to do to adapt and tweak and, and, and basically take care of myself. Uh, I've been doing these virtual shows and, uh, you know, those have been really, really fun. They're not the same thing as live events. You can, I can do some different stuff with them and they're really fun, but I know they're not for everybody. I have found a way to adapt, and I think other comics, other performers, I've seen a bunch of people adapt uh, in this in this situation. Um, you know, so I, I think I think it's the encouragement to adapt is what we need. You know, if you have somebody that you know that is having a tough time adapting, give them some encouragement. That might be that might be what they need. You know, be there for them, let, and and let them know it's you know it's okay. We have to be there for each other. Um, sort of the large point to that. Uh, in terms of workers, not only have they been traumatized by just shitty CEOs and, uh, you know, like even the middle management has to deal with bullshit on, a, uh, uh, on that front, is also like customers being shitty over really trivial stuff. Um, I've heard nightmare stories like my mom works at Target and I've heard nightmare stories of customers behaving badly to cashiers, to customer service people, to, you know, the fucking shipped in Instacart shoppers. Like, dude, you're, you'll be fine. Like, you know, maybe you don't need your lavender scented dildo this week. You know, like you've got four at home. I don't know how much you're using them. Maybe the lavender scent is wearing off. I don't know what the situation is. I'm not here to judge, but but maybe this week you don't need the lavender scented one, right? That's like not a that's like not a necessity. But 
is like I've heard horror stories of people treating grocery store clerks inappropriately, getting shitty with other customers in the store. Who do you think has to deal with that? It's the, it's those clerks, and now and now they have to you know that's that's a level of trauma that these that these essential workers have to deal with. And I understand that these Karens and Chads, that's the male counterpart, uh, is, I'm calling it to Chads, uh, they, they are also reacting out of trauma. And their trauma is that their sense of complacency has just been ripped away, right? It hasn't been eased out. It just kind of ripped away. Their sense of complacency is now gone. Like they have to think about how other people don't have health care. You know, and that's that's scary for them. The whole thinking about the other people part, super scary. They've never had to do that before. It's very uncomfortable. And that's not, I'm not trying to excuse their behavior. It's just trying to pinpoint what is the, what is the reason why they do that sort of stuff. Um, you know, is kind of trying to recognize that potential source point. Collective trauma doesn't mean that you have to be an asshole is sort of the point that I'm trying to make, is we're all kind of dealing with shit on our own. We all have stresses, both physical and mental, that we're dealing with. And adding to that by being shitty to each other, by being a bunch of assholes to each other, uh, it not helping. Making the situation a lot worse. Doctors and nurses right now are also facing PTSD um, just because of their work conditions, right? They, they're they not able to do the job that they want to do, to do the job that they are trained to do, uh, which is take care of sick people, take care of people that are not in a good condition to help humanity. That's what they've, uh, what, what the, the oath that they've taken. And, uh, and their work conditions are not good right now. They're not getting the necessary equipment like we talked about. They're working extreme hours. They're seeing, they're seeing people die alone, and then they have to talk to their family about how they died. That's like, I, I don't even know how you, like, where do you even begin processing that shit? It's, it, that, that part of it is, sorry to be so depressing, but that is the most depressing part about this, is not just the fact that people are dying alone, it's also the fact that the doctors that have and, and nurses that have to treat them have to now go talk to their family who can't see them, who can't see their loved one who just passed away. Like delivering, being the messenger for that news is, is difficult. And I can, I, I mean, I can tell you, like, as somebody that talks about heavy topics all the time, sometimes it does bear on you. Jay, Jay checks up on me <laughs> when I get, when I get real heavy and ranty into, into things, um, you know, it, 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 it can bear on you a little bit. It can bear on you a little bit if you don't have that outlet, if you don't, I mean, that's part of the reason, like, I don't know if you've ever hung out with nurses, uh, and doctors, but holy shit, did they make some dark ass jokes? Who? fucking they are dark they are dark brother they are fucking dark jokes uh veterans veterans also make some fucked up dark jokes <laughs> especially active duty vets i've heard some active duty vets that i'm friends with that are super anti-war that don't support the military industrial complex right that look at people like pompeo and they're just like these guys are bag of dicks but some of their jokes are fucking dark <laughs> but it, that's their outlet that's how they process that shit um you know but eventually those jokes come to a pause and and you have to do something and i think again i think the mental health stress that uh, a lot of the healthcare workers are in doctors nurses so on and so forth that is going to lead them to that strike um you know, which, which, if they get on board and they start really pushing this strike and push the idea of Medicare for all, I think that might get it done. Not instantly, but I think that that's going to push that idea way forward. Because again, we, we kind of idolize these folks right now, especially now. They're considered heroes. We're putting them up on a pedestal. 
And if they come out and it's like, hey, we've been treated like bullshit. And here's how we can fix this system. It's going to be, uh, it's, it's going to be some, you know, drive some real big change in that. In, in my opinion, I think that'll, that'll really shift the conversation of Medicare for all away from, oh, socialism, blah, 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 and, you know, to, to be like, this might be a, an idea we have to try now. Like, we don't have an option. The doctors are hurting because of this profit driven, you know, healthcare system. And a lot of the moderates, might, they're going to have to get on board, especially if they want to get reelected. If, if the gauge of the country, if the Overton window of the country starts shifting to the left, which it already has, right? The Overton window is, um, how do I explain this properly? Uh, I'm trying to think of how my friend Ron Placone explained it. It's basically the, the way people look at politics. Do they look at it with a centrist mind or a more left view or a more right view, the Overton window has shifted to the left in terms of the American populace, but in terms of the politicians, the Overton window has moved way over to the fucking right, way over to the fucking right, right? So as we shift more to the left, they're shifting more to the right. And once the leadership and the people are, are on polar opposites, I, that's, not a, that's not a good look. So it, the, the mental health crisis that, that essential workers and healthcare workers are facing might lead to a bigger strike to push ideas like Medicare for all and push the country further over to the left. And if these people want to get reelected, guess what? They're going to have to shift their Overton window even further to the left. Uh, I, real, I just realized that it's, it's a mirror. Uh, so my sh hand shifting is probably not going in the, in the right direction, but you get it. You understand what I'm saying? <laughs> So, you know, support your strikers, uh, treat, people, treat people in the grocery stores and all of these essential services um, with a little bit more kindness and respect if you're out there. You know, I, I try not to go up on people's faces, but every so often if I see somebody kind of freaking out, I, I got to be like, hey, you know, kind of relax. Whatever happened can be fixed you yelling is not a problem. I've done that once or twice and gotten shouted at uh, myself. You know, I just don't like seeing that shit. It bothers the hell out of me, especially knowing that I've been on the other side of that counter, right? I've been that. I've been the grocery store clerk or the, or the barista or whatever. And uh, it doesn't feel good. It doesn't feel good. Um, so be patient with each other going forward, especially in a post COVID world, we have to be patient with each other as we, as we get things back to where they need to be. Um, and be patient with yourself. That's a reminder that I need for myself, uh, quite often is, is just to be patient with myself because things are, things are difficult. This is kind of a weird, time frame and even once we come out of it you know it'll still be a little bit of a weird transitionary period and those weird transitionary periods suck you know it's 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 like moving to a new place you know when you move into a new place you yeah you got that little transitionary period where you just don't you know you don't know the layout of everything just yet right like like the, you don't know how how wide the room really is in the middle of the night, you, you, you stub your toe walking into a wall. You know, it's like, it's okay. It's got to be patient. We're going to figure it out. We're going to get through this shit. So, yeah, just try to be as patient as you can. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get through this thing. Um, you know, uh, like I said, on the ground floor, we need more solidarity. That's sort of the large point to, uh, to all this. Uh, let us look at your comments. Andrew. Uh, I'm worried for comedians because it's not just your work. It's an outlet for maintaining mental health, right? Uh, it can be. It definitely can be. Um, some comedians look at it as a form of escape, which which is a form of maintaining mental health. Um, and like I said, you know, there are there are people that the doctors and veterans and stuff like they make some super fucking dark ass jokes. And I know some super fucking dark ass comedians, too, um, that use it as, a, as sort of a processing center. So it definitely can be a way to maintain mental health. Um, you know, the more, the more I keep doing it, the more I realize, like, I just 
I like this. I like this being the avenue to discuss ideas. Um, my issue is that my brain kind of moves really, really fast. And if I don't get ideas out, they get stuck in my head and then they just buzz around. And it's like, you know, jolts of electricity is just firing all over my brain and I don't know how to control it. So it does became, it, it, it did become a, a way to kind of uh, focus the array of information that's going around in my head. Uh, so, you know, like people kind of get on my case about like, oh, you, you do too much, you're creating too much stuff. And it's just because that's the only way that I can process all of this stuff. Sometimes I get a little repetitive because it's me kind of processing everything in my head and finding what compartments to put them in. So, you know, and, and again, that is a form of maintaining mental health <laughs> because if, if it buzzes around too much, then, then it does ramp up my anxiety. It does ramp up, um, I, I guess even just a form of OCD in me, you know, is finding a way to organize these thoughts. Uh, especially when I start a new project too. Like sometimes when I'm writing for the Citizen Revolution stuff, if I'm trying to talk about a focus thing, like the next show I'm, I'm, I'm uh, talking about, I'm, I'm planning on talking about more election related things uh, like rank choice voting and, um, you know, uh, Eugene Debs, like talking third party type stuff. Uh, I really want to do a piece on Eugene Debs. Uh, so those are, those are kind of the things that I'm working on. And when I start, there are so many directions, so many ideas that I can take. I get a little lost and I do get anxious and I have to slow myself down, take a deep breath and then go point by point. And as I go, I'm, I'm organizing those thoughts, um, you know, so uh, and, and I would do that on stage uh, when I'm working out a new show, when I'm working out new material. I do that on stage now is sort of how I I process through those thoughts it's it's weird and different, but it is yeah, it is a way of maintaining. It can be a way of maintaining mental health for sure. Uh, Jay, uh, I both feel bad for and am annoyed by the guys who have comedian as their only identity. Yeah, um, yeah, I do too. I do too. Uh, you know, like I, especially after shows. Uh, if we land into a riff, you know, like when, when me and Jay hang out is if we land into us riffing about something, we land into something where we're just riffing about something. The people that are like, I'm a comedian and that's what I am force a way to try to cram jokes into it. And I've never been comfortable with that. <laughs> I'm just, I just, I've never, like, I've literally been in conversations where I know that they're trying to make a funny joke at every point. Like, I remember hanging out outside this open mic a couple years ago. And it's a, me and this other comic, and a younger comic comes in, right? I had been doing comedy for a few months. And, uh, and, and me and, um, my, his, his name is Mike. The, the veteran comic's name was Mike. Um, you know, so me and him are outside. We're bullshitting. We both done road gigs and stuff together and stuff. Uh, so we're bullshitting about um, just. I think the state of the, the the media is what we were talking about. And he comes over. The new kid comes over, and he's standing and listening to us. And then he's like, just very awkwardly stating jokes, like trying to make jokes about what we're talking about. And it's just like, no, that's not what we're doing. Like this is that's not what we're doing. We're not we're not doing jokey jokes right now. Like me and me and Mike are trying to have like a a serious conversation. Like I'm actually interested in what Mike's opinion is about this topic and vice versa, right? Like so, I, I th those kind of interactions. I'm always just like, what is happening? Just be a person. Can you just be like a person <laughs> for like ten minutes? Be an actual human being where you don't have to fucking crack a joke about a thing. Like, it's totally fine not to crack a joke about a thing for 10 minutes, right? Like, like, oh, you're going through, like, something with your parents? Cool, let's talk about that. You don't have to have a punchline to this. Uh, you can actually be a well-rounded human being. And it's just, yeah, it's so, it's so difficult. Because, I mean, that's the thing. It's like those, those folks do exist, and there's... 
And those are the folks that I think are having a really hard time adjusting and adapting um, to, to the digital landscape because to them, it's all about instant feedback. Um, the live streams are difficult to get that instant feedback. You know, um, the comments are awesome, but it's not hearing laughter. But the Zoom shows, the virtual shows, kind of are instant feedback. The timing is a little bit different, so you kind of have to time it a little bit differently, but it's a learning process. But to me, I'm my personality is just like, I like that shit. I like challenges. It's a new, it's, you know, my head works in problem solving ways. And I, and I fucking, I like, that's what I get excited about. I, like you present me with the problem. That's why I like working on new shows. Like once I record a thing and I'm like, yes, now I get to work on a new thing. Cause that's a new challenge for me to, to work on and find what, what my thesis statement is and how to build material around it. You know, that's fucking exciting to me. Um, and I know other people aren't hardwired that way and that's totally fine. Um, but I do see like right now being as rigid as I'm a comedian that gets on stage and does this thing and I have to be funny all the fucking, it, it's like that rigidity, rigidity doesn't help in this situation. I think, I think it ends up being a detriment to maintaining your own mental health, uh, to kind of go back to, to that point. Uh, Andrew, thanks for the poop and lavender dildo talk. <laughs> uh, I got to switch up Butterball, uh, <laughs> it's Butterball Comedy Fundraiser. Decent chance I'll figure out how, how to watch the next virtual show. I'm glad you're staying healthy. Thanks for tuning in, Andrew. Uh, enjoy the rest of your evening. I'm going to wrap up here. Hey, thank you so much for checking out this video. If you enjoyed it, uh, please give it a like. And please subscribe to my channel for uh, for more. There's going to be daily videos going up uh, on this channel. Uh, I am also uh, going to be performing virtual live stand-up comedy shows via Zoom. Uh, I've done a couple of these, and they've been super, super fun. So thank you to all the people that have already purchased tickets and uh, come out to these shows on a regular basis. They're, they're pretty fun. I'm going to be doing them every single Friday in the month of June. Tickets are available for those right now on my website at krishmohan.com. So it's June 5th, June 12th, June 19th, and June 26th, going at 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Pacific. Uh, if you're in the other time zones, I think you can figure out what, what time that <laughs> these shows are going to be on. Uh, they are going to be, each show is going to be a little bit different. They're going to be covering topics like the one uh, in the video that you just watched. Uh, again, you can grab your tickets at krishmohan.com. That's K-R-I-S-H-M-O-H-A-N every Friday at June, 9 p.m. Eastern. Uh, and uh, if you are a sustaining member, you get a free ticket to every single one of these shows. Uh, and you can become a sustaining member over uh, on my website as well. And uh, I know I know times are tough, uh, so if you are in a financially precarious situation, please send me a message uh, or an email, and I will happily give you a code that will get you a, uh, a free ticket to attend these shows. Uh, I'm also releasing my brand new stand-up comedy album, which if you're a sustaining member, you get an early, uh, early release version of, early, uh, early copy of. Uh, it is available on my Bandcamp page to pre-order right now, and it comes out June 1st. So you can go to ramennoodlescomedy.bandcamp.com, get, uh, get your copy of it uh, for only a dollar. You can pre-order it for only a buck. If you want to donate a little bit more, that would be awesome as well. Uh, there are more videos like this coming up. I'm, I'm going to be doing uh, a bunch of live streams pretty regularly from my Facebook page and uploading and releasing videos via the YouTubes and uh, and the on the audio podcast versions as well. So stay tuned, make sure that you like, make sure that you share, and make sure that you're subscribed to these pages because content like this often gets, uh, gets suppressed. So uh, thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you so much for hanging out. And uh, till the next one, we'll see you on the road. Thanks.